Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week. We have a lot of stuff to cover once again. From Ship 25's inaugural six-engine static fire, Starbase continues to expand. We celebrate the 10-year anniversary of one of the most spectacular launch failures of all time. SpaceX's Falcon 9 performs another successful launch. All the updates you need from the past week on the International Space Station and so, so much more. This is a jam-packed episode, so I hope you enjoy it. There have been some great developments at the build site down at Starbase. For starters, the mega bay continues to rise, with the structure now at three levels high. We also saw the rear hood of the booster quick disconnect moved down to the launch site. This was removed from the booster quick disconnect not long after the first Starship integrated flight test, and it serves the important role of protecting all of the propellant and power lines that connect to the booster before launch. Shortly after arriving at the launch site, we saw it reinstalled, indicating that the repairs to all the flexible pipes and hoses have been completed. Returning to the build area now, in very exciting news, Starship Gazer captured our very first close-up views of the colossal stainless steel plate that will soon be positioned beneath the orbital launch mount. This is a water-cooled steel plate that also releases the jets of water for the water deluge system. Here is a photo of the machine that will transport it down to the launch pad. Ryan Hansen put together this little render showing how this will work. At the launch pad itself, lots of progress continues to be made. For the past few weeks, we have been watching workers removing chunks of debris and laying the rebar ahead of the pouring of the concrete. And last week, we counted around 130 loads of concrete being delivered to the site. Over the course of 11 hours through the night and into the morning, we watched crews continuously pump all of this concrete into the water deluge plates foundation beneath the launch pad using three pump trucks. The work finished with the foundation mat left half full, with the second half presumably to come in the coming weeks once the first half has had the chance to sufficiently cure to enable this. I think the best story from Starbase last week was the successful static fire of Ship 25. Yep, despite the fact that there is still a lot of work that needs to happen to enable the next orbital flight test, this vehicle is smashing through its test campaign at record pace. Ahead of its static fire, we saw it undergo flap testing, shortly followed by propellant loading, and then there it is! A six-engine Raptor static fire. We got another really cool drone shot from SpaceX, showing this test from above. Great stuff. This is likely the last major step required of Ship 25 before it completes its first flight, which, given the rapid pace of the launch pad repairs, could be as early as August, though it is worth noting that a lot of things need to happen to facilitate this, so we'll just have to wait and see. Last week, I dived into the news that SpaceX will be using hot staging for future Starship flights, which will necessitate modification to the Super Heavy booster to allow venting of the Starship engine exhaust and to protect the booster from damage. As you can see, this will increase the height of the booster, meaning that the Starship quick disconnect arm won't be able to reach the ship's interface panel. This is probably the reason why we saw crews removing the end of the Starship quick disconnect arm last week as part of ongoing works to adapt it to the new design for the boosters. I would imagine we'll see the arm given an extension that allows it to reach the new height of the ship's panel. As for future vehicles, on Thursday a Starship payload section specifically designed for Starlink satellites, consisting of five rings and that payload bay door, arrived at the high bay. The section is set to be integrated into a test article, marking an important step forward in the Starship payload bay development. The orbital tank farm has received a welcome upgrade. A longer methane tank was successfully delivered to the launch site. It was then lifted and installed onto its supporting pedestal, increasing the capacity of the propellant farm. Saturday was host to SpaceX's only launch last week. It's kind of funny actually that it's weird to only have one Falcon 9 launch to talk about, considering that one launch a week would still be crazy cadence for any other launch provider. Anyway, this was launched from Cape Canaveral, carrying the European Space Agency's Euclid satellite, which is a telescope that will hopefully be able to shed some light on the nature of dark matter and dark energy, two of the biggest modern mysteries in the universe. On Tuesday, we saw a Soyuz rideshare launch at the Pistochny Cosmodrome in Russia. This was the successful launch of the Meteor M No. 2-3 hydro meteorological satellite, as well as 42 rideshare small satellites, mostly from Russia, but one from the United Arab Emirates, one from Malaysia, and one from Belarus. 
Weighing in at around three and a quarter metric tons, the Meteor M23 represents the fifth satellite in the Russian Meteor M series, distinguished for its remote sensing capabilities. The primary objective of this satellite is to collect invaluable hydrometeorological data from its designated orbit of 832 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Virgin Galactic has officially launched its first ever commercial mission, marking a significant milestone for the company in its pursuit of operating space tourism missions. On Thursday, four passengers were successfully sent to suborbital space and then safely returned. The historic flight took place at Spaceport America in New Mexico, lifting off and reaching suborbital space after 58 minutes. The space plane achieved an apogee of 53 miles before returning to Spaceport America and landing. The space plane, VSS Unity, had undergone several test flights in 2019 and 2021, including a memorable trip with founder Richard Branson. After a two-year hiatus for maintenance and upgrades, Unity and its carrier plane, VMS Eve, were deemed ready for increased commercial operations. A successful test flight back in May this year paved the way for Virgin Galactic's inaugural customer flights, with hundreds of people already having reserved a seat on Spaceship Two. The company aims to conduct its second commercial flight in early August and plans to operate monthly flights thereafter. Looking ahead, Virgin Galactic envisions a fleet of space planes and carrier craft that will enable a higher cadence of space travel, potentially even daily flights from various locations worldwide. The introduction of the new Delta-class spacecraft, expected to begin in 2026, will bring the company closer to achieving this goal. In Artemis updates now, on the 22nd of June at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, teams installed the heat shield onto the Artemis II Orion spacecraft within the expansive high bay of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. The primary objective of this 5-meter wide shield is to ensure the safety of the astronauts aboard the spacecraft as it's exposed to the intense external temperatures of re-entry that can reach an astounding 2,800 degrees Celsius. The Artemis II mission will serve as the inaugural expedition with human crew members, enabling comprehensive testing and verification of all critical systems on board the Orion spacecraft, which are essential for future manned missions. That's Artemis II, but what about Artemis III? Well, here is the Orion spacecraft for Artemis III inside a clean room in the high bay of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. You can see that it's wrapped in a protective wrapping which is currently in the process of being removed as part of its preparation for its launch atop the SLS rocket designated for Artemis 3, which will send astronauts, including the first woman and first person of color, on a mission to the surface of the moon. In recent weeks, a SpaceX Dragon cargo spacecraft successfully delivered scientific instruments and new rollout solar arrays to the International Space Station. The mission reached its conclusion last week with Earth Splashdown, marking the 28th cargo resupply mission from SpaceX. On Thursday, the spacecraft undocked from the Harmony module on the space-facing side of the space station, followed by a parachute-assisted splashdown off the coast of Florida on Friday. The spacecraft didn't return empty. It carried various experiments and samples that had collected data in microgravity. Inside the International Space Station, NASA astronaut Woody Hoburg tended to the ongoing Plant Habitat 3 experiment, which investigates the growth of second-generation plants using seeds previously produced in orbit. This research aims to understand genetic changes in plants due to the stress of spaceflight that could provide insights for future space missions' food production. Additionally, it was revealed that the environmental control and life support systems on the US segment of the space station now recover 98% of the water delivered, up from the previous rate of 93%. This accomplishment is attributed to the urine processor assembly and the brine processor assembly. Water reclamation is essential as astronauts require about a gallon of water per day for drinking, food preparation and hygiene. As the astronauts jokingly say, yesterday's coffee becomes tomorrow's coffee. <laughs> we had a great spaceflight anniversary last week. Yep, on Sunday, 10 years ago, this Russian proton rocket lifted off the pad and then performed a spectacular flip and nosedive. The reason for this was because of the fact that the inertial measurement units were literally installed upside down. Another reason that this launch is so fun to watch is because it doesn't look like the flight termination system was activated, so we got to see the rocket literally fly towards the ground, breaking up just before impact under the aerodynamic stresses. Anyway, that about wraps up today's episode of Space This Week, which once again is made possible thanks to my generous Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. If you want to see your name on the left there, 
and you can sign up to either using the links below but otherwise there are two videos there from my channel one should be my most recent video essay on ksp2's wobbly rocket problem i'm really proud of how this one came out so check it out if it sounds interesting guess it's kind of relevant to that proton rocket crash right because that rocket didn't wobble when it flipped either <laughs> anyway thank you all so much for watching and i'll see you in the next one